so thank you everyone for, for joining us for the second to last talk in our week long G4G celebration of mind uh, virtual 2020 event. This will be our 20th, uh, 20th presentation, 20th talk. And it's, it's my big pleasure to, to announce uh, Ezra Bud Brown, uh, who is an alumni distinguished professor of mathematics uh, with degrees from Rice and LSU, very well known within the community already. And he's going to talk uh, to us about puzzles and wonders from Elwin, Richard, John, Ron, and Martin. Thank you very much. This is a great pleasure. Thank you, Tiago, uh, for uh, setting me up in such a nice way. Thank you for Calm. Thanks, Calm, for inviting me. This is going to be just a sort of a sampler of some of the recreational mathematics, if you will. Some, it's all recreational. Mathematics is fun, it's a recreation, at least for me. So these uh, uh, five lads up here, as Calm calls them, uh, have been involved in. So let's get to the, what we're gonna have, what might be in store. We're gonna talk about Elwin Burleycamp and his The Game of Dots and Boxes. Then a couple of items uh, uh, about Richard Guy, uh, one of them was a paper he wrote called Not Enough Small, uh, Strong Law of Small Numbers. And then there's some co connections that Richard, who loved connections, made at the beginning of a book called The Unity of Combinatorics. Uh, after we get through those guys, we will get to a truly marvelous picture. And I think you will agree it is a truly marvelous picture. Right after that, we'll talk about John Conway, a tea party of six, and Ron Graham, uh, and finally Martin, Alice, Escher, the monkey and the coconuts, a new kind of cipher, and the final picture. So let's move on. Right away, Elwin Burleycamp. Known for algorithms, for efficient ways to detect and correct errors in all kinds of applications. Known for algorithms for efficient futures trading in the financial market. Co-author with John Conway, and Richard Guy of Winning Ways for Your Mathematical Plays, a four volume set that's probably the principal work on recreational mathematics. Ellen was one of the founders of G4G and he has something that he wrote a book on the game of dots and boxes. And we're going to do a little analysis of that right now, including the double dealing move. The double dealing move is very interesting. So let's see what this is all about. Okay, here's a setup. We got a grid of uh, four by four by four grid of, of dots. And you've played the game before. You know, what happens is that you draw, uh, each player takes, the players take turns uh, connecting dots that are adjacent either vertically or horizontally. You can't skip over, for instance, and connect uh, M down to E. You can't do M to J, no diagonals are allowed. And so you have 16 dots. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that we've played for a while and we're at this point. Now, whoever, so by the way, I have to tell you, the two people are playing are uh, me and Elwin, right? Okay. Now, either of us, the natural thing to do now is uh, to connect up I and E and F and B. So let's do that. Now, what we're going to have next is uh, the difference between the clued-in professional and the clueless amateur. I'm going to play, I'm going to be the next person to play on the left, and Elwin is going to be the next person to play on the right-hand grid. This is me, this is Elwin. So what I've done, I'm a greedy guy. I want to grab up, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you a rule, I'm sorry. When you complete a box, you get another turn. But there's more to it than that. If you get another turn, you must take another turn. And that's part of the charm of this particular setup. All right, so I got the box. Uh, I've got this box here and this box here. And I see a chance to grab another one. And then what am I going to do? Well, I get it after another turn. So I do this. Now what happens? I finished four boxes, but you know what? I have to take another turn, and no matter which of the vertical or horizontal lines I connect here, it's Elwin's 
turn and he gobbles up all five of them. And I lose five to four, he wins five to four. Now we go over here and it's Elwin's turn and Elwin understands the basic principle of delayed gratification. What he is going to do is he is going to, he, he filled these and so there's an, there's a, an E there in each of those, they're invisible. But instead of doing G to C, he does H to D. Now, what happens? He has not completed a box. A box is a, uh, a square. This is not a square. And so guess what? It's my turn. Well, I have to do something. Well, if I do anything but G to C, I'm only going to end up with, uh, I'm Gonna, gonna end up with very little at all. As a matter of fact, if I don't do G to C, I'll probably, uh, Elwin will probably get every single box. So I do G to C. Now I have to make a turn to, to, to play. And you see, one of those up there, Elwin clears the boards and wins seven to two. Okay, well, that was fun. Now what? Let's talk about Richard Guy. Richard Guy is one of the astounding and amazing figures of 20th century and early 21st century mathematics. He was mentor to literally thousands of mathematicians and math students over an 80 year career. An 80 year career? He was doing mathematics before I was born. He was old enough to be my father. I don't think he is or was, but he was enormously prolific during his career writing a dozen or more books on combinatorics and number theory and recreation, including the unity of combinatorics, where I was blessed to be able to be his co-author. Unsolved problems in number theory with over 2,000 entries, 300 papers, including one we're going to look at right now. A prize-winning paper in which Richard argues that there just aren't enough small numbers to cover all the demands made on. Let's look at two examples. Now, some of you will know these because you're mathematicians and some of you might not know them because they're, they're not simply algebra and calculus. Okay, the strong law of small numbers. Well, the numbers two to a raise to a power of two and add one, these seem to be primes. Uh, for zero, one, for the exponent two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, and two to the four, you get primed. Does this pattern persist? Well, maybe you know, and maybe you don't know. Now let's look at the other one. The other one is a little more accessible. These, these numbers up here double in size, double in length, double in the number of digits every time you advance one. These aren't quite so bad. The number two to the n minus one can't be prime unless n itself is prime. But uh, for the exponents two, three, five, and seven, we have primes. Does that pattern persist? What do you think? Hmm? Think about it. If you know the answer, don't say anything. Later on, you can say, all right? Now, Richard, Guy loved connections in combinatorics. And in fact, the entire book, The Unity of Combinatorics is about these connections. Uh, he, was, he was trying to show the uh, reading public that combinatorics isn't just a big bag of tricks, but it has connections all over the place and the connections are subtle. So here we go. We're gonna start out with real recreational mathematics. It's as recreational as you can get. Dudley Langford was, uh, actually his profession was chemistry, but he had uh, a child who one day he observed the child playing blocks, playing with blocks on a rug. The kid was, you know, maybe in single digits. So what does he have there? Notice that the two red blocks have one block between them. The two blues have two blocks between them and the two greens have three blocks between them. Well, Dudley changes those, those letters to numbers. And now you've got N blocks between both pairs of both of the occurrences of N. 
two blocks between, you know, one block between a one, the ones, two blocks between the twos, three blocks between threes and so forth. And you can also do this with, with, with four pairs. Try as you may, you can't do it with five or six. Well, as a matter of fact, you can't do it with two or one either. Just try, just try, uh, you can't. And you can't do it with five or six, but you can with seven. And these so-called Langford sequences uh, exist for n pairs whenever n is either a multiple of four or one less than a multiple of four. All right? Now, that's not enough. Tharolf Skolem saw this and said, hey, I think I can do something else. So what he does, take a Langford sequence, tack on two zeros at the end and add one to each number. Now the upper row in the first block, in the first uh, block of two rows, uh, those are the uh, arrangements of the four pairs of ones, twos, threes, four, where the positions differ by one between seven and eight. The positions differ by two between four and two. The positions differ by three and the positions differ by four. Well, you know what? That says that we have an interesting subtraction going on here. Eight minus seven is one. Five minus one is four. Four minus two is two and six minus three is three. And look what we have here, the bottom row. You have all the first two rows of this array are the numbers from one to eight. And the bottom row is the result of their subtraction and is the num are the numbers one, two, three, and four. That's kind of magical, isn't it? But wait, suppose we don't restrict ourselves to a particular value of n, but we'd like to do this for all the positive energies. Is it possible? Is it possible to find not uh, a finite set of numbers, but an infinite sequence of numbers, two of them in fact, whose differences are the positive integers exactly once. And you know what? You can. And here is one way. These particular numbers, the sequences A and B, are called Beatty sequences. Named for Samuel Beatty, who described them in an American Mathematical Monthly uh, problem from 1926. It's not really obvious where these numbers come from, but if you look at the bold face numbers, do you recognize those bold face numbers? Of course you do. They're the Fibonacci numbers. Am I gonna tell you all the details? No, aren't you glad? Yes, well, you can read about them in that book. It isn't that hard. But anyway, we go on from here to have a connection between the Beatty sequences and a game called Vitoff's game. See, we've got Beatty sequences here, Skolem sequences, Dudley Langford, Langford sequences, Skolem sequences, Beatty sequences, and now White Vitoff's game. You have two piles of coins, and a player may take any number of coins from one of the piles, either of them, uh, up to and including removing the entire pile, or the same number of coins from both piles. Uh, the player taking the last coin wins. This is an example of an impartial combinatorial game. We'll get to some more of those later. Now, uh, it can be shown that if your moves make the sizes of the two piles turn out to be corresponding members of the Beatty sequences A and B, such as one and two, three and five, four and seven, we can back up on that, see? One and two, three and five, four and seven, six and 10, right? There they are. If, they're 11, if, you, if, you, if you can land on the pair 11, 18 in some way, then you can win. If you went, land on three and five, you can, what about one and two? Let's think about that a minute. What are the possibilities? You either take, if your opponent has the move, your opponent takes the single pile of one, you take the pile of two and win. He takes the pile of two, you take the pile of one and win. You take, he takes one from the pile of two, you take both of ones 
he takes the one, a one from one and a one from the other, he takes the other and wins. All four cases, he wins. And it's interesting to note that Vitoff's paper describing this game appeared 21 years before Samuel Beatty's problem appeared in the monthly. So why aren't they called the Vitoff sequences? Now, don't worry about that. We're going to move on. Well, answers from the strong law of small numbers. Guess what? Fairmont made the first claim, and he was wrong because Euler did a little bit of trial division and proved that 2 to the power 2 to the 5th plus 1 equals 641 times the seven-digit prime. And most folks think that there aren't any more of uh, these numbers that are prime. The second one, these are uh, the ancients might have thought that they were always a prime, but they were wrong also because two to the 11th minus one is a product of two primes. There aren't very many of these numbers of primes, just 51 have dis been discovered. And now for something completely different. Isn't that gorgeous? That is a wonder. Look at this. It's the pattern is certain lines within something called a uh, Penrose tiling. And these lines are uh, joined, are, are composed of things that look like bow ties. Uh -huh. And in fact, there are two kinds of bow ties, long and short. And I could go into all sorts of details, but, the, but this is just beautiful mathematics. Don't you think? I think so. Don't you? Of course you do. And since we've mentioned John Conway, let's talk a little about his work. John made notable contributions in many, many areas. You can see them up there, uh, number theory and so forth like that. And he also made notable contributions in recreational mathematics, including combinatorial game theory, uh, cellular automata, you might know about the game of life and analysis of algorithms and a few other things. And those are some of his books, three of them. He's written several others. And honestly, John Conway was a force of nature. So let's move on. We're going to have a tea party. This is going to be a tea party of six. Wait, where is everybody? Oh, they've just arrived. Six people are at a tea party. Some of them know each other. We will call people who do know each other friends. Some of them don't know each other. We'll call them strangers. Now, I want you, you if you're in the modern generation, I'm, I am here to tell you in this conversation, friend is not a verb, okay? Now, it is a fact that among these six party goers, there are either three mutual friends or three mutual strangers. Let's see why, okay? Let's name our characters. Our party goers, Allison, Barb, and Carol, and Dan, and uh, Ellen, I think, and Faye. Alice might be friends with some or none of them. Strangers could be with some or to some or none. But of the other five attendees, either three or more of them are friends of Alice, or three or more are strangers to Alice. See, you, uh, you have two possibilities, two categories, and you're sorting five people into two categories. Now, absolutely have to have at least three people in one of the categories. Uh, it just doesn't work out any other way. All right, so let's see what happens with those three people. Suppose uh, Alice does have three or more friends at the party. Let's say Alice's friends with Bob and Carol and Dan. Now, there are two possibilities. Either there exists a friendship among two of the, uh, between two of the three, Carol, Dan, and Bob, say Carol and Dan, then Alice is friends with Carol and friends with Dan, and Carol and Dan are friends. Those are three mutual friends. If that circumstance does not happen, then, Bob and Carol and Dan are mutual strangers. Isn't that interesting? A party of five will not do because there is a way to assign two friends and two strangers to each party goer. Now, this is surprisingly difficult 
to figure out if you're really trying to use real people and you, know, you have two friends and uh, they know somebody you don't know, each of them, and they, they each are known to somebody else, a fifth person who doesn't know either of us. That is surprisingly hard to do. Try it. You'll enjoy it. You'll like it, maybe. This problem is the tip of a very large combinatorial iceberg called Ramsey theory. Ramsey theory addresses questions about how large a particular kind of structure has to be in order to guarantee that it contains another kind of structure. So what we had here was how big a gathering do you have to have so that you'll have either three mutual friends or three mutual strangers. Now, in fact, you can do this with any number, but these numbers are surprisingly difficult to compute. If, uh, suppose you wanted to determine the smallest number so that no matter what, you could, there are going to exist a set of four mutual friends and three or three mutual acquaintances. Then you would have to invite nine people to the party. If you were going to have a uh, party and insist that either four of them would be friends or four of them would be mutual strangers, then you would have to invite 18. Beyond that, it gets really hard. There are some other cases where you have three mutual friends and a whole bunch of other uh, strangers. I think the size of the stranger pool goes up to at least 10 and four mutual friends and five mutual strangers is known about five mutual friends or five mutual strangers their upper and lower bounds for this but nobody knows what the number is and this is a classic unsolved problem and uh, you might call it uh, combinatorial games or something like that or you could call it recreational mathematics but as I said, mathematics is fun. And if it's fun for you, that's recreational mathematics. If you like taking square roots, go for it. I like square roots, don't you? Of course you do. Okay, as, so now back to uh, what, was going, what we have here is the fact that uh, this field on Ramsey theory, uh, one of the great world, one of the world's leading experts on Ramsey theory was in fact, Ron Graham was one of our five lads here. So he is another interesting character. Let's find out a little bit about him, okay? He was a pioneer in Ramsey theory. He has had groundbreaking work in number theory and, and other discrete mathematics. Uh, he has worked on scheduling problems, discrete geometry, probability and statistics, the mathematics of juggling. He is one of the few uh, mathematicians who has been president of both the American Mathematical Society, which are mostly the researchers, and the Math Association of America, which are mostly interested in undergraduate in teaching at the under, mostly at the undergraduate level. But Ron was also president of the International Jugglers Association. And y'all think that's a, not impressive. Well, gee, I don't know what to tell you. Ron Graham was an athlete. He was an acrobat, a gymnast, a juggler, a tumbler. He even appeared with Cirque du Soleil once upon a time. And he was a friend of Martin Gardner, which brings us to our fifth lad. Martin Gardner was not a mathematician by trade. He was a journalist. He was an English major in college. He took maybe one math course and he didn't really do all that well. But somehow or other, he ended up at Scientific American, the, mu the magazine working for, the scienti for Scientific American. And the editor asked him to write a column about recreational mathematics back in 1956. He said, how long do I have? And he gave him a timetable or something like that. And he starts poking around in the literature and he discovers some interesting 
gadgets called flexagons. And his very first column mathematical games was about hexaflexagons. And he mentioned triflexagons and tetraflexagons. And that's where it started. He introduced the world, among other achievements, he introduced the world to Moritz Escher. Introduced Moritz Escher to the world of mathematics and both of their careers just took off. It was he who mentioned, who uh, gave publicity to John Conway's The Game of Life. In 1958, he wrote a column uh, talking about a very interesting and maddening problem called the monkey and the coconuts. Uh, he introduced Penrose tilings to the world. He did also introduce public key cryptography to the world. And public key cryptography uh, was a great benefit to a part of the uh, society you don't know about. You might not think. Public key cryptography was a kind of uh, uh, safeguarding of secrets where the secret, the difficulty of finding the secret was based on a hard problem of number theory, the integer factoring problem. And that's where it started. He introduced the so-called RSA algorithm. The title of the column was a new kind of cipher that would take millions, will take millions of years to break. Well, the millions turned out to be 17 years because of the interest in uh, these uh, public key crypto systems started by Martin Gardner. Yeah. And uh, it gave jobs to hundreds, maybe even thousands of worthy number theorists. And I'm telling you, I'm a number theorist. And for a while, I was one of the worthy. These are only things to name a few. The many puzzles Martin included in his column helped move recre make recreational mathematics a popular and a vibrant area of both research and entertainment. His Annotated Alice is one of my favorite books, and he steered a large number of readers into mathematics and related areas. Now, this is the complete graph on five numbers, on five points. Complete means every pair of points is joined by an edge. Now, this would be the configuration if you removed e the center star, where you would have these two people know each other, 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 and everybody else is strangers. But you know what? There's something better to do with this. Within the last two years, Elwin and Richard and John and Ron, Ron passed. Martin passed in 2010. They're gone, but not forgotten. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for this beautiful talk. I'm going I, to applaud my audience. <laughs> well, the audience is applauding you already. They're, they're posting things in the comments. Uh, terrific, thank you. Um, and I would very much like to invite everyone to ask questions. And we already have uh, the first one, which is, how did you get to be Richard Guy's co-author? Well, that's, that's an interesting story. Richard wrote uh, a 30-page paper in the middle 90s outlining a series of 24-hour lectures uh, whose point was to show that combinatorics had many, many connections and wasn't just a bag of tricks. There was interest during the 2000s of uh, getting Richard to uh, turn this into a book. Uh, the, the book acquisitions person for the uh, Mathematical Association of America, uh, Don Albers, kept insisting that he should do this. And after a while, Richard was realized that he was getting old. Well, yeah, he was getting old. He was over 90. And uh, he wanted, they wanted to publish this, but what they wanted to do was to get a younger author. Now, who should it be? Well, uh, I had I'd already met Richard back in uh, 2004 uh, in Phoenix, and that's where I met Ellen Burleycamp. 
because uh, I went to a book signing and Elwin and, and uh, Richard and uh, John Conway were supposed to be there, but John wasn't there. So I actually, my contact with Ellen Burlicamps, I shook hands with him. And, uh, but uh, Richard and I got to be friends. And uh, it turns out that uh, I had changed directions in my career and was doing a lot of writing of expository mathematics. And we were at a meeting, a summer meeting, both of us, in 19 in 2013 right 1913 mm, not quite 2013 and don albers looked at me across the room he was standing there with richard and he made this gesture come on over here come on over here and i with trepidation you know, I took my dose of trepidation and walked over there and he put one hand on my shoulder and the other hand on Richard's shoulder and said, I hereby W co-authors. And he turned and walked away. And that was 2013 and it was a long slog, but it was well worth it because the book came out in, Mar in May of 2013. The last th communication that uh, Richard and I had was the, uh, the, des the cover design. And if you'll excuse me about 10 seconds, I'll go grab a copy of a book that I have here and I can show you. Here is the book, the unity, the, the cover. Uh, the cover is a Venn diagram that includes the finite projective plane of order two. And uh, the last communication that Richard and I had was that we agreed that this was a really cool cover and this is the one we wanted. By the way, this is a, uh, this is a promise, not a threat. Uh, if you happen just for one reason or another to uh, buy one of these and uh, you mail it to me, I'll mail it back with uh, a nice inscription. That is a or very not. nice offer. <laughs> Speaking of books and given your, your, your presentations, is there, is there a reading list you would recommend to, to, uh, to attendees? The best thing you can do, if you really want to get introduced to recreational mathematics, is to get one of Martin Gardner's many books that include his columns and like that. He also has a couple of uh, books called uh, Aha, uh -huh, gotcha, or something like that. And those are, those are a whole lot of fun. Uh, I almost, I'll tell you, I almost met Martin Gardner. Uh, there was a, an event at a summer meeting that I was at, and, uh, I, uh, and I, I read in the program that Martin Gardner was being honored uh, for uh, expository writing at this meeting and I was thinking, oh boy, oh boy, he's gonna be there, I'll get to meet him. And I got there and discovered he doesn't go to meetings. So I never got to see meet Martin, but uh, you know, I, I have, uh, if you wanna read it, if, if you're interested in other things, uh, Martin's book, uh, The Annotated Alice is just an incredible book. And I bet you've got one of them there. Um, let's see. And this is a beautiful version of it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it's, uh, and also speaking of Alice, uh, there's a, an issue of, uh, Math Horizons back in, uh, the 2000s, the late 2000s, that, uh, is an interview with Lewis Carroll. It's an interview. Now you're thinking, this guy's <laughs> impossible. Yeah, right. Well, it starts out with uh, I'm uh, I was walking in my garden, and I uh, I heard uh, I was looking at uh, my uh, we have some we have some tiger lilies growing in our backyard, and I heard this strange voice saying, "They can all talk." <laughs> 
You just have to be able to listen to them. And I looked over and there was Lewis Carroll. And so we had this conversation. Now, of course I made it up. I mean, Charles, Charles Dodson was, was, a, was huge in, within recreation mathematics and- Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, yeah. and they're just well, fun reading. They're, they're, they're just <laughs> fun reading. Read the Alice books. If you haven't read the Alice books, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland Through the Looking Glass. By golly, go out and buy them now. Leave this gathering and go buy those books. People are also asking how they could reach out to you. Uh, is there a, a good way to, to contact you? E uh, my uh, email is the best. My, uh, my email, listen up, folks. Somebody write it down. Is E-Z Brown, E-Z-B-R-O-W-N. That's easy to remember, at math.vt, that's V for Victor and T for uh, Tyrannosaurus, dot edu. So send me an email. Ezra, thank you so much for, for this very, very beautiful and very uh, abrasive talk. And uh, thank you so much. It is my pleasure, really, seriously. I love to talk. So, yeah. <laughs>